Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Tony said, I am Vic, uh, Head of Infrastructure at Trussell. I actually joined Trussell about four months ago, so a lot of what I'm about to talk about is uh, before my time and learned from testimonials from other employees. Now I'm going to start with a shameless plug. We are hiring uh, across product, uh, data and infrastructure, so if you are interested and would love to see my lovely mug every day, please come and speak to me or I'll leave my email address uh, at the end of my talk. So I want to start with an actual little bit of a disclaimer. I actually really like Kubernetes. I think it's a really, really good project. And there's a lot of very innovative stuff happening in the ecosystem around Kube. Uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of kind of new paradigms being defined for platform engineering. And ultimately, it's driving the art of platform engineering forward. So it must be good, right? But the experience with Kube at Trussell <laughs> has been anything but great. Uh, this could be down to a number of reasons. Uh, we had a very small team, uh, very inexperienced with infrastructure. Uh, for a long time, there actually wasn't even a dedicated infrastructure engineer in the company. So all of this could add to the fact that we had a very hard time with Cube. And as I said, your mileage might vary. Um, you know, if you have a stronger team or you're more capable of learning as you grow, then you might actually be experiencing some success with Kube. Out of interest, how many of you are using Kubernetes in production right now? And how many of you would call yourselves a startup? Interesting. Very few of you. So let's take a look at some of the decisions behind the Kubernetes story at Trussell. So I saw this tweet a few weeks ago, and it reminded me a lot of our experiences. So Jameson Lopp, who's the CTO of uh, Casa Hoddle, which is a Bitcoin mining rig, uh, said that debugging open source software that's built with technology unfamiliar to you, but you're running in production, is like ex performing life-saving exploratory surgery on an extraterrestrial being that crash landed in your backyard. That really is what sums up a lot of startup experiences with Kubernetes. The journey that Trussell took with infrastructure is fairly common amongst the startups that I've speak and spoken to. Uh, so in 2016 is when the first two engineers at the company were hired. Um, they decided that all the back-end services would be built using Node.js. And they chose to use AWS because at the time, it just looked like the best cloud provider for them to use. And they chose to use Elastic Beanstalk for no other reason than they had some previous experience with it previously. But ultimately, they wanted that turnkey experience and they decided to use CodeShip for build just because it was free and because it would build them Docker images. And neither of them had any experience with Docker. And they were using the old hat Vagrant for local development. So, so far, you know, fairly reasonable decisions. Nothing there I would say would hold them up. Then in 2017, after a bit of funding, the engineering team started growing. And the complexity of the product started growing too. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, Trussell is an online mortgage broker. So the mortgage process is very complex, and the services that we are building are becoming increasingly more so. So at this point in 2017, as the kind of product code base started growing, we experienced some growing pains with Elastic Beanstalk, namely unexplained blips, um, no automated housekeeping, and general kind of inflexibility of the tool. So at this point, they also realized that um, they needed someone with dedicated skills to help them scale. So they hired their first infrastructure engineer, who, and also a QA engineer who switched from Codeship to Jenkins. And in 2018, the first Kubernetes clusters were spun up at Trussell. Uh, now at this time, uh, AWS didn't have EKS, so <coughs> The Kubernetes clusters were spun up using KOPS or COPS, whatever you want to call it. And the services were migrated off Elastic Beanstalk uh, to Kube fairly quickly. But the problem was a lot of this was done from a kind of firefighting mindset rather than a fire prevention mindset. So there wasn't a lot of forethought put into the migration path, the user experience 
and automation to kind of help that journey and make the services grow with Cube. So as a result, there was a lot of very upset developers. In fact, uh, one of the developers I spoke to said, for most of 2018, there was at least one Kubernetes related outage every month. In some cases, more than that. And as a result of this, as I mentioned, very unhappy, dissatisfied team. And I imagine the engineers that put Cube at Trussell felt very much like Dr. Frankenstein, wondering what the fuck did we just build? <laughs> now what developers really want from infrastructure is essentially Hogwarts. They want a magical environment where code builds itself, tests itself, deploys itself, <laughs> writes itself, makes your coffee, and the business also runs itself. What Cube promises is to do all of that for you <laughs> and to do all your heavy lifting and handle your scaling, your monitoring, your logs, and actually give you an App Store-like experience for your infrastructure. But as a platform engineer, I'm a call me old school. I don't like a lot of magic in my infrastructure. I like infrastructure to be a bit more like a hardware store, full of tools that do one thing, do it well, and work exactly as advertised. Like Ron Seal, I like my tools to do exactly what they do in the tin. But what Cube actually delivers is something in the middle. <laughs> it kind of works, uh, but only if it's really well supported, if there's tools around there, and if you have an experienced hand to kind of guide that journey. So it's clear that there was a very big mismatch between Kubernetes as a technology and the experience and skills of the team. And there's a very big misunderstanding of how it actually worked in production. Um, there was lots of kind of undocumented tweaks that were made to the cluster. Uh, you know, so you could either configure things using GitOps, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, with a firefighting mindset, somebody was just kind of hacking away. And that's not really a great way to build Kubernetes clusters. In fact, our staging cluster and our production cluster I counted something like 65 differences in variables, not just the values, but actual configuration. So that means deploying to staging is not even a close representation of what it's like deploying to production. But fundamentally, if you have a team that barely knows how to look after one turtle, why would you then hand them a stack of turtles to look after? The big problem here was that there was just too many turtles to look after for the entire team. Now, this slide is an interesting one. So this is taken from the Cloud Native Foundation website. Uh, and this is up to date, it's from 2019. And what's quite clear from here is there's a vast number of solutions out there in the Kubernetes ecosystem, which is great because it means it's a very thriving space and there's lots of ways to solve the same problem. And now Amazon, Google, and Microsoft all have managed Kubernetes deployments. So that means as startups, as infrastructure engineers, we can, in theory, easily deliver that container as a service experience for our developers. And also, in theory, because I've never seen anybody do it in production successfully, that multi-cloud seamless experience that businesses ultimately seem to want is now, at least in theory, achievable. But looking at this slide, how does a resource-constrained startup even begin to make a decision? You know. How does a startup decide which uh, service mesh to use or which configuration management tool to use? There isn't really a one-size-fits-all solution here, and that's both a blessing and a curse, because it means you have that flexibility. But because it's still growing, it's still learning, there hasn't really been kind of key paradigms set, or this is the best way to do things if you're building this type of service, whereas we have that already with infrastructure as a service. And ultimately, it's complexity, operational complexity, that led to OpenStack being in its kind of half-dead state. And I'm going to say something controversial, at the risk of you lighting all your pitchforks, is Kubernetes becoming the new OpenStack? I don't think it is, but this kind of gives us a picture that it might be heading that way. I'm just hoping that the, cloud, the community is a bit more aware of what they're doing here. Now, one of the kind of key tenets 
of a good DevOps journey is that the infrastructure should help, not hinder innovation. And as a result, it's innovation that helps a startup grow, get that money, and eventually get acquired. So for an early stage startup, the focus is really on rapid iteration, experimenting quickly, getting results quickly, and trying to really find their product. They might not even have funding. You've got very limited resources. So as a result, the focus here is doing enough on the infrastructure side of things that lets you iterate. Trying to put too much fanfare and process in at this point is ultimately just going to lead to frustrating developers and slowing that experiment cycle down. And the reality is, whatever you build is probably going to be out of date in a month's time. So there's not much point putting too much uh, process around it. Then as the company grows and it approaches kind of seed series A, got a bit of funding, the team grows, the focus slows down a little. I mean, it's still kind of iterating towards product market fit, but now you've got a little bit of breathing space to start putting some process in. So things like automated builds and deployments, uh, having a baseline testing and QA infrastructure, and even an early stage data infrastructure. And I would say at this point in time, your data infrastructure would probably be built by gluing together lots of SaaS solutions because you're not really going to have a big data problem unless you're building a cryptocurrency exchange or building a bank. So as the company grows, you know, as we approach Series B, Series C, the product market fit has been achieved, the VCs are now clambering to put their money into you, this is when is a good time to start focusing on continuous delivery practices because you've got a solid understanding of your infrastructure, you've got a solid understanding of product, and you've got a team that lets you support um, the kind of tooling initiatives. So if you haven't already, be focused on infrastructure as code, but ultimately automate as much as you can at this stage. And then when the company really starts kind of hitting that hockey stick hyper growth scale, that's when you start revisiting your early architectures. Now I've seen too many startups that have started with a kind of microservices architecture and ended up with either a distributed monolith or realizing that actually microservices aren't really helping them get that rapid iteration on achieving that product market fit. So really, you should do enough to get your product out there. And it's only when you've achieved the scale and you have a team to support it that you should really start revisiting your architectural assumptions. And you can look at more exotic things like chaos engineering or exotic technologies. It's at this point that you really should start looking at that stuff, not earlier. So where does Cube fit into this kind of typical startup journey? The reality is you could drop Cube in at any point, but there's trade-offs to be made. If you deploy it at the start, yeah, the cost of implementation is low because you've got no prior art. You're building from scratch, but the problem is you've got an inexperienced team, lack of resource. Most seed stage startups don't even have a dedicated infrastructure engineer. So you're kind of placing a lot of operational burden on the founding engineering team to manage everything at scale. And then at the end end of this, if you start implementing Cube at this kind of point, you've got the added burden of migrating existing workloads to Kubernetes, but the trade-off there is you've already automated all your processes, you've decoupled the engineers from your infrastructure by layers of automation, so the user experience of infrastructure isn't impacted as much. So the reality is I would say once you've automated this bit, that seems like a natural fit to start looking at something like Kubernetes. Now we're going to play a game. I'm going to show you some architecture designs. I'm going to explain uh, a few scenarios. And you're going to tell me if it would cause an outage or not. <laughs> so here we have a typical multi-master Kubernetes setup on AWS. The three masters are split across three availability zones, each with their own 1-1 one -one autoscaling group. And we have a bunch of workers, again, each in their own autoscaling groups. <laughs> Workloads on them are evenly distributed. There's nothing particularly glamorous or exciting about this stack. Uh, it's fairly bog standard. So what happens when an EC2 instance degradation occurs and takes one of the masters out? Outage or no outage? Outage. No, I'm hearing more no's than yes. <laughs> 
So what's the right answer? Outage. So this happened twice during my first month at Trussell. Uh, what actually happened, thankfully it was a staging cluster, so no customer facing impact, but the DNS controller pod, of which I didn't realize there's only one of, happened to be running on the one master that got killed. So when that died, it took out DNS for the internal cluster. And as a result, this cascade of issues kind of fell through. I know that in newer versions of Cube, they've moved to uh, OpenDNS rather than KubeDNS, which makes it a lot easier to kind of split out your workloads. But I can't tell if this is just a weird design decision of Kubernetes defaults or COPS defaults. Either way, it was quite annoying when I found out. Right, next. So here we have a bunch of pods behind uh, Nginx Ingress. We have nine pods. Um, and looking at the stack, uh, metrics look OK. Resources look OK. There's nothing untoward in the logs. Um, everything seems fine. So outage or no outage? <laughs> you probably know where I'm going with this, yeah. Outage, partial outage. So this happened two weeks ago, actually, uh, in production. We had one service uh, which had no dependencies. It was just serving a bunch of HTML written in Node.js. And it was actually running uh, nine pods behind Ingress. And what we actually experienced is intermittent failure. So every couple of requests, um, they would hang for about 10 seconds, and then we get a response. And it was difficult to determine the root cause of this because everything looked normal. It's very difficult to debug. And the way I solved this is just to downscale the number of pods in the back end. So it's likely that one of the pods was misbehaving, but everything was passing its health check. Everything was logging correctly. And when you curled it individually, it was working fine. So yeah, I have no idea what happened here. I still don't know what happened here. But hey, outage. <laughs> so I've spoken about the struggles with Cube that we've had at Trussell. What are we going to do to fix them? And as I've alluded to previously, the plan for this year is to actually move away from Cube uh, to ECS and Fargate. Now, I realize ECS and Fargate have some of their own issues as well, but the focus is really on simplicity. My thinking, at least, is if you work with AWS primitives, the idea is they're kind of turnkey out of the box, and it's a lot easier to debug. You don't have those weird ingress quirks that I was mentioning previously. And we're building out a new multi-account architecture. So currently, everything lives in a single AWS account, which is not good for blast radius and all kinds of stuff. So the plan is to build new architecture using Terraform. We don't even have infrastructure as code right now. So yeah. And uh, it's going to be built on top of uh, Transit Gateway. How many of you have heard of Transit Gateway? Good. So you, I'm not completely mad starting on it. It was only announced in November last year. It's essentially a managed version of a transit VPC. So the plan is to kind of centrally manage all your routing layers and have all these VPCs connected with Transit Gateway and then drop a VPN in. But the real force multiplier for the entire team, as I've mentioned previously, is automation <coughs> and focusing on continuous delivery. Right now, the engineers are actually deploying to production from their laptops running Helm deploys, which is pretty scary when you think about it. And it makes me very nervous as an infrastructure engineer because there's no logs about what's going on with the laptops. And quite often, an engineer will kick off a deploy and walk away. Good. But the real kind of mission for me this year is to make a team of essentially junior infrastructure engineers out of the current engineering team. You know, if we want engineers to be comfortable with working with the cloud, we need to show them what it can do, how it works, and be comfortable having those discussions, learning the services that they can use to help build their and deploy their software. Right now, everybody kind of fears what they don't understand, and the team is afraid of owning things beyond writing feature code. So my plan is to kind of change that. So in conclusion, 
when building not just Kubernetes, but any kind of platform implementation, focus on the needs of the team and the skills of the team. There's nothing worse than having an inexperienced team trying to manage a Ferrari or an F1 race car. Like, if they don't have the skills, knowledge, or experience to understand that, or reverse engineer it, you're going to have a bad time. And really try and get as much automation as you can done up front before you start moving platforms. And the big one for me is good developer user experience earns trust. If you deliver that experience that works out the box, which is what Cube promised for a lot of us, then there's no reason why a developer can't have that Hogwarts-like infrastructure experience. And they'll remember the tools that they've used. And they'll remember that you built them, which indirectly means that they trust you more. <laughs>